Thanks to Jonathan Silver and the other organizers. It's really a pleasure to be speaking at this conference. So today I was asked to share with you some thoughts about American religious liberty. So I thought I would start with some observations about religious liberty during the founding, including the influence of the Torah in the American conception. Second, I will explain the connection between limited government and religious liberty in our constitutional structure. And third, I will discuss some of the challenges posed to the structure by the administrative state. And I'll finally conclude with some observations from my latest position about the important but ultimately limited role of the courts in protecting religious liberty. So let's start at the beginning. Um, America was founded by people who considered religious liberty an inalienable right, one bestowed by the creator on each person. The framers of the Constitution also considered religious liberty essential to developing a citizenry able to enjoy the fruits of constitutional liberty within a, oh, sure. Within, um, sure. Um, the framers of the Constitution also considered religion essential to developing a citizenry able to enjoy the fruits of constitutional liberty within a republican form of government. As John Adams said in 1798, the government has, quote, no power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. So the framers believed that preserving constitutional liberty would depend in part on individuals having positive virtues and morality, primarily the type of morality developed through religious practice and commitment. And the founders recognized that religious freedom would promote religious flourishing. The First Amendment protects free exercise of religion and limits the establishment of religion, not to push religion out of the public square, but instead to strengthen faith and religious practice. Religious freedom thus recognizes the importance of faith to a free people. Just as free enterprise would promote a robust economy, so would free exercise promote a more vigorous religious sphere. These principles are, are no doubt likely familiar to this audience. The Torah or the Old Testament influenced the predominantly Christian founders. The fifth book of the Torah, the book of Deuteronomy, was the most frequently cited source during the founding era. Citations to this far exceeded citations to any other religious or secular source. It was cited more than John Locke or Montesquieu or Blackstone. And the themes of Deuteronomy were, of course, prevalent in so much of our discussion, so much of the founding era's discussion. And General Washington famously admonished the people that it was up to them to determine whether their newfound freedom would be a blessing or a curse, not to the present age alone, for with our fate will the destiny of unborn millions be involved. So that brings me to my second point about how the framers sought to enshrine and protect their freedom. Religious liberty is one essential aspect of the American commitment to limited government, the rule of law, and individual liberty. It is part of a broader understanding of the role of government in our lives, a role in which government aims towards some areas of the common good, but leaves most decisions to individuals, their families, and their religious and local political communities. It seems sometimes in the totalizing and polarizing discourses of our time that we have lost sight of the simple truth that goods may be irreconcilable. Indeed, irreconcilable views are rarely answered by a single government policy that picks one side over another. Living with the spirit of liberty requires understanding that individuals will have different beliefs, interests, talents, and ways of living. Our system recognizes that government cannot require conformity to a single grand truth without suppressing individual liberty, a liberty that includes freedom to exercise one's religious beliefs. So our Constitution established a system that could accommodate these different beliefs and at times irreconcilable views. Part of the solution was keeping government to a limited sphere. In particular, the federal government would not provide an answer to all of the problems of social, economic, and political life. Rather, it would be a national government of limited and enumerated powers. So the Constitution created a system that would make it difficult for the government to exercise power. It's hard to pass a law in the United States, and that is part of an intentional design. Our collective system of lawmaking evens out differences across our society. Ideally, it requires give and take, 
eliminates extreme positions and ultimately aims to something like the common good. And once our laws are passed, they're implemented by a democratically accountable president, and any disputes that may arise are arbitrated by an independent judiciary. The separation of powers and the checks and balances between the three branches of government are designed to protect the life, liberty, and property of the American people. And this constitutional structure would protect religious liberty the way that it protects other liberties, by leaving people as free as possible to pursue their own happiness. President Washington perfectly captured the sentiment in his well-known letter to the Jewish congregation in Newport, Rhode Island. He wrote, May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants. While everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. The letter, of course, invokes the prophet Micah, and Washington apparently references the concept of a person's own vine and fig tree over 50 times in his correspondence and writings. It's the idea that individuals should live together in goodwill without fear of their neighbors. Respecting each person's right to enjoy their own vine and fig tree particularly protects religious minorities. Minimal government interference allows people to cultivate and enjoy their property and to pursue happiness in their own way, so long as they do not interfere with the rights of others. Moreover, in a country where religious freedom flourished, such principles would be reflected in the political process. As Tocqueville recognized, religion in America takes no direct part in the government of society, but it must nevertheless be regarded as the foremost of the political institutions of that country. For if it does not impart a taste for freedom, it facilitates the use of free institutions. And our free institutions have often worked to protect religious liberty. Although the political process may not be perfect, Congress has often protected religious liberty. In recent years, passing nearly unanimously laws such as the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, both of which protect religious practice against government intrusion. I think the popularity of these laws reflects the commitment to the American public. Although Americans profess many different faiths, and some Americans profess no faith at all, across our society, Americans are instinctively protective of religious liberty and expect their representatives to defend religious freedom. And so that brings me to a few observations about the threats to religious liberty from the administrative state. As I explained, one of the most substantial protections for religious liberty stems from the basic structure of the Constitution, which divides limited powers between three distinct branches of government. During the Progressive Era, the Constitution, its basic structure and its values, came under challenge. Proponents of progressive government favored, favored government by administration and expertise, and openly recognized that their plan was hostile to the Constitution. Indeed, they frequently explained that outmoded ideas of individual liberty and protection for private property would have to be pushed aside to make way for new ideas. These new ideas of administrative government were largely developed in Germany, and they became popular by prominent intellectuals in the United States, such as Woodrow Wilson, whose model of government and of people was of a perfected, coordinated beehive. Progressives were forthright about the revolutionary nature of their proposals, and they found no need for dissembling because they sincerely believed that the Constitution was an impediment to their new understanding of government and of human nature. In line with their beliefs, they created new institutions and structures of administration that challenged the original constitutional structure as well as the individual liberties the Constitution was designed to protect. So in the time I have here, I will focus on just one of the changes, and perhaps the most consequential, which is really the shift of lawmaking power away from Congress and towards administrative agencies. While our Constitution, Article I, vests all legislative power in Congress, Congress has increasingly delegated this authority to administrative agencies. Rather than hash out the details of difficult social and political questions, Congress often enacts the broad outlines of a program and leaves it to the executive branch to fill in the details. And that's really the basic mode of government today. Consider areas such as environmental protection or health and safety, labor law, financial regulation. All of these policies are primarily set by executive branch agencies, not by Congress. 
And the shift of policymaking away from Congress and to the executive has fundamentally changed the operation of our government. It has also changed the structure of lawmaking. The Constitution made it hard to enact laws, in part to protect individual liberty. Um, sorry. Um, the Constitution made it hard to enact laws in part to protect individual liberty and private action. By contrast, delegation to agencies makes it far easier for the government to regulate private action, and this expansion of the federal government shrinks the realm of private choice and association. These changes have arguably made it more likely for government to threaten religious liberty. With a broad mandate, agencies often have gone far beyond anything required by Congress to regulate religious institutions and the religious practices of individuals and businesses. Many of the most high-profile cases involving religious liberty today have challenged administrative action, not laws passed by Congress. I believe Mark Rienzi will talk about some of these examples in his comments. And so I'm not going to focus on the cases, but my point is really a more general one about the structure of decision making. Congress is the first branch of government. Its members come from around the country, representing many different professional and economic backgrounds. They serve a broad range of constituents with varied interests. Members must be generalists who have to vote on the full spectrum of matters before them. They have direct democratic accountability to the people for their choices. By contrast, when Congress delegates to specialized agencies, those agencies operate on very different principles. Agencies are designed to focus on their particular programs. They have expertise, which can be useful for implementing the law, but they do not have the sensitivity to the broad range of concerns across our society. Agency officials, unlike members of Congress, usually come from a much narrower slice of America and from a professional class of government workers. Before I became a judge, I was the administrator of OIRA, the regulatory czar in the White House, and I worked with many fine government experts, both within OIRA and in the agencies. And these people often have a very deep expertise and commitment to the public good. Yet policymaking in this narrow sphere can sometimes result in tunnel vision on religious liberty as well as on many other important issues. Agencies simply lack the type of broad-based representation and accountability found in Congress. Representation and accountability that, in our society at least, has historically supported protections for religious liberty. So then this finally brings me to the role of the courts in protecting religious liberty. Federal judges today swear an oath that echoes, um, echoes the same oath that Moses proposed for judges in the book of Deuteronomy. Both oaths require judges to decide cases impartially, without respect to persons. Moses exhorted the judges to judge righteously and to hear the small as well as the great. Similarly, I recently swore an oath to do equal right to the poor and to the rich. While Moses said that the judge should not be afraid of the face of man, Hamilton in The Federalist emphasized the importance of courage to a strong judiciary. So the courts provide an independent check to ensure that the political branches do not trample on the Constitution and on rights such as those enshrined in the First Amendment. As Hamilton explained in Federal 78, judges would be the bulwarks protecting the people from encroachments by the political branches. Without judicial review, Hamilton explained, all the reservations of particular rights or privileges in the Constitution would amount to nothing. And as Chief Justice Marshall famously recognized in the earliest days of our republic, the courts must say what the law is. He established an important role for the courts in keeping the political branches within the constitutional, Constitution's limits. And courts, of course, continue to exercise this essential power of judicial review. So when Congress delegates authority to agencies, courts must ensure that agencies do not exceed the boundaries of their statutory authority, that agencies do not push up against the Constitution in their actions, and that administrative decisions are reasonable and incorporate the participation of a wide swath of society in accordance with the law. The courts must decide the cases that come before them in a manner that respects the Constitution and the dictates of the First Amendment. But important as judicial review is, courts can only respond to the action of the political branches, um, can only respond to the actions of the political branches. They can decide only cases and controversies that come before them. 
as Hamilton said, the courts have neither force nor will, but merely judgment. So standing alone, the courts may be ill-equipped to prevent cultural and other threats to religious liberty, most pressing in our society. The first protection for religious liberty, as with any individual freedom, comes from political recognition and respect for these rights. In a society in which government plays a greater role in social and economic policy, conflicts between government regulation and religious liberty are bound to accelerate. The framers thus had connected individual liberty, and particularly religious liberty, with a limited government. They had faith that without government interference, Americans of different beliefs and commitments could find ways to work and live together and to govern, govern themselves to promote the common good. Deciding the extent of government involvement in the private sphere is a choice, and it is a choice with deep consequences for individual and religious liberty, and ultimately a choice made by the people in our constitutional democracy. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you to uh, Jonathan Silver and the rest of the organizers for having me here. I'm honored to be on a panel with Judge Rao and uh, Commissioner Professor probably some other titles for, for Danielle Mark as well. Um, let me give my brief standard introduction and disclaimer, which is I have many employers. I work at a religious university, Catholic University. I'm Catholic. Um, I work at a non-religious university, Harvard Law School. I represent clients of all different faiths. I'm not speaking on behalf of any of them. I'm just giving my own personal views here today. Um, what I want to talk to you about is the way a lot of religious liberty issues are headed toward the Supreme Court right now. We're actually headed into a phase where I think the Supreme Court will be deciding um, how to apply the First Amendment and how to apply our religious freedom laws to a lot of the big controversies that have been bubbling up over the past really 20 to 30 years um, in our legal system and in our culture. And a lot of those things seem to be coming to a head right now. So what I want to do is I just want to introduce the idea and briefly flag several of them that I think are particularly <coughs> important to people of all faiths. <coughs> One of the things that um, I see in my, in my professional life working at Beckett where we represent people of all faiths is that the fight over religious liberty is really a fight in which people of all different faiths have a stake. Um, much of the important religious liberty law in this country was made, for example, by Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, uh, but the truth is a lot of my freedoms were developed in lawsuits involving Jehovah's Witnesses. Some of our freedoms were limited in lawsuits involving uh, Native Americans who wanted to smoke peyote in the woods. I'm not a Native American. I don't want to smoke peyote in the woods, but my rights have been restricted because of the decision. So as you think about these cases, I'd like everyone to just keep in mind the idea that when it comes to religious liberty, there's a sense really in which we're all in this together. And that's another reason that I, I really do appreciate uh, as a Catholic being invited to come speak at this event, because it's a fight that I really do think involves uh, people of many different faiths. And if, if we're going to protect the rights, a lot of people have to stand up and be willing to protect them. Um, and I'm also very grateful, by the way, uh, to Commissioner Mark and the other folks who've organized the Jewish Coalition for Religious Liberty, because I think it's a very important organization. I think it's, uh, I think it's a great development um, to bring more people into the religious liberty fight in a, in a strong way. Um, as you know, from any time you've turned on your computer or flipped on the television or opened the newspaper, if anyone still opens newspapers, um, Americans disagree about all the big and important things in life. We disagree about sex and God and religion and life and death and war and peace. Uh, and the First Amendment is really the framer's attempt to find a way for people with all of these different beliefs about really important stuff uh, to be able to come together and live together in one democracy, right? How are we going to do that if, if we're all different? How are we going to do that um, if the Jewish citizen has one set of religious obligations and the Catholic and the Muslim have other sets of, of obligations? The First Amendment and our religious liberty protections, I think, really are the answer to that. And in our big, powerful with our society with our many big, powerful governments, and Judge Rao talked about the rise of the administrative state, which more and more is the source of the religious liberty conflicts that we face. But the truth is, in our big, powerful administrative state and otherwise big, powerful governments, most of the time, there are ways for governments to achieve their interests that don't require them to uh, interfere with religious liberty. Sometimes there are irreconcilables. Um, very often, the truth is, if people approach issues in good faith, there are ways ways that uh, people can work around religious differences, and we can actually use our differences um, in a beneficial way. 
Let me just rattle off a handful of the big issues that are headed to the Supreme Court right now, probably for this term or next, so really in the next two years. Um, one, just to stick with the administrative state for, for one more minute, the ongoing fight with the Little Sisters of the Poor over the contraceptive mandate, believe it or not, A, isn't over, and B, is probably going back to the Supreme Court this term. Um, <clears throat> that fight is a classic example of a stupid fight. Um, if you had set out at the beginning and said, gosh, I really want to get contraceptives to everybody in the country, no Nobody would have said, okay, great, bring in the nuns. Get me the Catholic nuns, because they'll be good, they'll be really useful for this. Right? Um, the idea that the United States government, which can put, put a man on a moon and, and put mail in your mailbox every single day, needs Catholic nuns to help them give out contraceptives <laughs> is really just a dumb idea. Um, and it's the kind of idea that you only have, frankly, if you don't think seriously and in good faith about working around the fact that your neighbor may have different religious beliefs, right? There's no reason it can't be a country in which we have two things simultaneously. A, access to contraceptives for those who want them, and B, Catholic nuns who can say, thanks, but I don't want to participate and I don't want to be involved. It's actually not that hard. Um, it's going back to the Supreme Court. Um, the sisters will win. Um, <laughs> It's easy for me to say that in part because I know they're praying for it and <laughs> they have powers I don't have. Um, a second big issue going to the Supreme Court or likely headed to the Supreme Court in the near term is something called the ministerial exception. Um, Catholic parishes don't have people who we call ministers. Jewish synagogues, I don't think, have people who, who Jews call ministers. Um, but the term is one that in American law is intended to be broad, right? The, the idea of a ministerial exception relates to people who preach and teach the faith within a religious group or within a religious school. Several years ago, my law firm won a 9 nothing victory at the Supreme Court recognizing the existence of the ministerial exception and the idea that religious groups ought to be able to hire and fire and pick and choose who, who are going to be in the roles of teaching and exemplifying the religious faith to children and to people in their, in their congregations. Unfortunately, over the past several years, there's been a lot of division in the lower courts over how do you figure out exactly who counts as a religious minister, particularly for groups that don't label people ministers, like Catholics and Jews. Um, so recently, one set of cases in the Ninth Circuit out in California involved Catholic schools where someone's a, a fourth or a fifth grade teacher, and every single day, they pray with the children, and they teach religion to the children, and they participate in sacraments and religious services with the children. Yet the courts there said that person's not a minister. That person doesn't count as a minister, and therefore the government can tell the, tell the church, you need to keep this person teaching religion to the children, or you need to keep this person in that role. Similar case in the Seventh Circuit involving Milwaukee, a Milwaukee Jewish day school about a teacher who taught Hebrew. Um, and some of the lower court arguments were saying she taught Hebrew in a, in a, in a grammar school, um, and she prayed with the students, and she taught them about religious observances and so forth. Um, and there was an argument. That court came out the right way. But there was an argument about, well, does she really trigger the ministerial exception? Um, these cases are likely going to the Supreme Court, and here's why they are crucially important. If religious groups do not have the ability to control how they teach the faith and who they hold up as examples to the faith um, and who's going to do the teaching, then the government has way too much control over our religious groups. Right? And so the freedom of groups to pass on the faith to their children, to run their religious schools the way they want to run them, um, is deeply, deeply involved in this question of personnel and how are we going to figure out who's there. And the short answer, and the answer I really expect the Supreme Court to come up with, is look, if someone has a job that involves teaching or preaching the faith, the government really has to step back and not be involved and not try to micromanage who gets hired and what are the terms of dismissal and so forth. That's not a government decision. That's a decision for uh, faith communities to make. Another issue that is the Supreme Court will take up this spring involves participation of religious schools in public voucher and other government funding programs. So there's a case out of Montana. It's called Espinoza. And in the Espinoza case, the state of Montana has an old anti-Catholic law called a Blaine Amendment. So Blaine Amendments were enacted in the mid to late 1800s when there were big waves of Catholic immigrants coming in, and they weren't terribly popular. And so many states, often at the urging of Congress, Congress for many Western states, forced the states to have this in their new constitutions. They have <laughs> provisions in the Constitution that forbid any government money from going to any religious school. 
Um, our Establishment Clause doesn't require anything like that. In other words, under our Establishment Clause, it is quite clear that if the government has a program that any school in the state can participate in, Religious schools, too. They can participate on equal terms. Um, in the Espinoza case, the uh, state of Montana decided, well, if religious people are going to participate, if religious schools are going to participate in this program, we just have to shut the whole thing down. Um, the Supreme Court has agreed to hear the case. I strongly suspect they've agreed to hear the case because they think what happened in Montana is incorrect. And religious people and religious schools have a right to participate on equal terms in government programs along with everybody else. This is an issue we've litigated in the past related to FEMA, um, the Federal Emergency Management Association. So every time there's a big hurricane, FEMA comes in and, and they do a lot of great work and they help pick up the pieces and help people put their lives and their businesses and their buildings back together. Well, for years, FEMA said, um, you know, if, if, your, if your grocery store was, was flooded, sure, we'll help you repair the grocery store. And if your library was flooded, we'll help you at the library. Um, synagogue, sorry, we can't help you, you're religious. Right? They basically took the, the position that, well, it's government funds, and we can give them out to everybody on the block, and then we stop if there's a cross or a star or something else on the door, and it's religious. Um, thankfully, the federal government changed its position on FEMA, but this is still uh, common within our federal and state governments that there are these programs that say, essentially, religious people and religious groups can't participate on equal terms. Um, I think the Espinosa case is an opportunity for the court to fix that once and for all from the top. Um, there will likely be cases challenging the Supreme Court's decision in Employment Division versus Smith. So this is a free exercise case from about 30 years ago that Justice Scalia, um, in many ways an excellent judge, but got this one terribly wrong, said that the free exercise clause only gives people um, relatively narrow protection from government encroachments. It says as long as the government's treating everybody the same in a neutral and generally applicable law, that um, the fact that it infringes your religion is no big deal. Uh, just to give you one example of ways in which this comes up, think about a prison and people who have to have a kosher diet or a halal diet, right? The prisoner needs to be treated a little bit differently because that's his religion, right? His, his religion says, I can't eat the same food that everyone else is eating because I have some different requirements. In a constitution that affirmatively protects the free exercise of religion, that actually ought to be an easy question, which is protecting the free exercise for the Jewish prisoner is actually just a different thing than protecting the free exercise for the Catholic prisoner. They're different people. They have different requirements. Um, and we've had to fight in court to get prison systems to give Jewish prisoners kosher meals. Um, we've by and large won those cases. But the Supreme Court's probably going to revisit the constitutional question of how does the free exercise clause apply um, in the coming years. Um, last one I'd like to flag for you, something that involves people's relationships with their employers, which is Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. That law was enacted by Congress to protect all of us from religious discrimination and to require employers to um, accommodate people's religion. Um, it had been given a narrow interpretation in the past. There's a case with a Seventh-day Adventist who keeps a Saturday Sabbath um, that is headed to the court this term that I think will likely give the court an opportunity to uh, interpret that law broadly in a way that says employers need to accommodate religious uh, religious observances of their employees um, as long as they can reasonably do so. So all of these cases headed to the Supreme Court. It's a big time for religious liberty. What I'd flag about the cases, again, is there are people of a bunch of different faiths with their cases, but they really affect all people of faith, all faith-based institutions. And it's important for people to realize that when the Seventh-day Adventist is up there fighting at the Supreme Court, um, he's actually fighting for my rights and your rights, too. Thank you. Thank you.